Hey everyone. We are live. Hey guys. So attachment theory, triggers, and solo polyamory with Leah Marshall. Correct. I'm pronouncing it right. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to talk about uh, Leah's experiences with couples privilege and also share some honest perspective from both sides of the fence. My side being a little bit more we're all on the spectrum, but a little bit more on the hierarchical polyamory side and Leia's experience more on the solo poly side. So it's going to be an interesting kind of uh, back and forth conversation, hopefully very useful to all of you who are struggling maybe on both sides of that fence. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit of background, then I'll do my shameless plug stuff and then we'll dive into the conversation. And by the way, if you guys are joining us, please, uh, Say hello, drop a one if the sound is good, use the hearts and the wows and the emoticons, let us so that, that everybody knows that we're live and all that good stuff. But um, sorry, Leah, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I think probably the most notable thing about me related to this conversation is about three and a half years ago, I founded a relationship group called the Esther Perel Discussion Group. And I imagine a lot of the folks in Leveled Up Love are familiar with Esther. She's written two books, one on the tension between love and desire and how they relate, but how they also conflict. And then also a second book on infidelity. And I saw Esther speak and just was really, really taken by her ideas, um, very provocative. And after seeing her speak, actually, I had just been ghosted in kind of a painful way. And she ended her talk with this line, in dating and relationships, we're often picked for a role that we didn't audition for. And in that moment, I thought to myself, I was absolutely picked for a role that I was not interested in. And I had picked him for a role that he was not ready for. Wow. And um, I just remember like really wanting to talk about her ideas with other people. And I have a lot of intellectual smart friends, right. but I feel like relationships are kind of an acquired topic. Right. Um, and so on a total whim, I was at Lewis Howe's Summit of Greatness. And I think that evening after hearing her speak, I just started the Esther Perel discussion group, not thinking anything would, you know, become of it. And, you know, just over three years later, we're a community of over 13,000 from around the globe. And we've been kind of known as the safe, shame-free, judgment-free space to talk mm -hmm. about all aspects of relationship, from sex and desire to infidelity, to modern dating, to masculinity. And so that's a little bit about my history. And I share that because I'm pretty new to polyamory, but because of that group, I'm really immersed on a minute to minute basis on topics related to relationship and relational awareness and relationship skills. So I do kind of bring that, that passion for human connection to my polyamory and the way I practice it. Wow, interesting. Um in that community, there's, would you say like it's 90% conventional relationship type talk and maybe 10% polyamory? Is it? Is it no, I'd say it's probably 60% monogamy, Okay. 35% poly, 5% uh, other. <laughs> okay. All right. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So again, for those of you that are joining, uh, I've got a bunch of questions that I got ahead of time uh, from a post earlier. So we're going to try to cover that. Um, and if you have any questions or thoughts or comments, please drop them um, here and I'll be checking for comments as we go. And my shameless plug, <clears throat> um, please don't forget that next weekend you can join Jessica Fern, Kamala Devi McClure, and the rest of our team for an immersive and transformative experience to secure poly experience. And you can learn more at leveleduplove.com slash weekend. Also some updates. You spoke, we listened with new pricing packages to fit every budget. And we even have some other creative energy exchange options for partial or full scholarships. And also it's been asked uh, because not everybody's available the whole weekend that you can now watch the entire weekend with recordings on demand on your own time and schedule. So obviously we recommend that you do the whole live experience. 
And if you want to just drop in real quick, uh, just friend me on Facebook if, you, if we're not already friends and use Facebook Messenger to private message me or email hello at leveleduplove.com to set up a time to chat for a few minutes. And I'll share a little bit more at the end. Uh, I've got a couple more shares, but let's jump into this topic. It seems to be a really juicy topic. And I think that one of the things I've learned in having these interviews and in having these conversations is like setting the stage and defining what we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Because one person's solo polyamory is completely different than another person's solo polyamory. And sometimes I wonder, and I'll ask you this, ultimately, what is the difference between a solo polyamorist and a single and dating person in your mind? Yeah, to me, it's night and day. I mean, it's it's kind of the same difference as what's the difference between a single and dating person and someone who practices polyamory. Right. Um, so for me, I really value autonomy, both my own and others. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned the group, which is a big passion of mine and also takes up a fair amount of time and energy. And I have a lot of other passions that just are really important to me and yeah. make me come alive. Um, I'm super active. I do a lot of dancing. Um, and I also am an introvert and need a lot of time to recharge and kind of like bring my best self to life. Right. And at the same time, I really, really value relationships, obviously. You know, it's why I started the group and why I spent the majority of my time thinking and talking about relationships. And so it's kind of this, these two tensions between like wanting autonomy, wanting time to recharge. I don't want to have kids. I don't dream of getting married, right? but also like really valuing emotional connection and physical intimacy as well. And so, so far you can still do all those things, single and, and dating, being in relationships with different people. Everything you've described, you can still have. So I don't far. know. I'm not sure if I can get the, my bucket for emotional intimacy, vulnerability, um, authenticity, um, you know, like vulnerably sharing in yeah. a casual. So this is so interesting because defining words, what's dating? See, in my mind, it's all, it's all like, you know, maybe English is a second language for me. So maybe I get confused sometimes, but uh, dating to me can mean seeing someone, not just going on single dates, but seeing someone for a prolonged, like I'm dating, I'm not settling with anybody, mm -hmm. but I'm just seeing different people. Um, yeah, I, I feel like when I think of dating, I think of a masked version of ourselves. Okay. Like we're kind of performing a little bit. Not as much depth with the word dating for you. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got and you. I, you know, I immediately, when you shared that, I thought of like this idea of the relationship escalator, we date, we like each other, we become exclusive. We start living together. We buy a home. We start a family. We merge finances. All of that, right. and none of that appeals to me. Got it. But like really being unmasked with a partner, being vulnerable, being authentic, um, all of that is super attractive. And I have not experienced that in casual dating. Understood. That make, that makes it more clear. Another differentiator that I think um, between single and dating and solo polyamory, I think, is the idea that metamors may know each other. And, and that to me is one of the key differentiators for polyamory. They're, they're, they le at least know of each other, but especially when possible, maybe even talk to each other or meet each other or have some sort of, of uh, cordial relationship with each other. I think that's what helps it be more polyamorous than an open relationship for me. And again, it's all mm -hmm. subjective. And you don't really have that when you're seeing different people single and dating yeah which also lends itself to what I, what i think is like sexual safety and emotional safety kind of go hand in hand too because you're not able to have sexual safety conversations when you're quote unquote again single and dating and seeing different people you're not going to be like hey who are you? you don't talk about the other people that you're seeing and you assume sexual safety but you don't really know 
because you're not having the conversations, right? I never yeah. assume sexual safety and yeah. I always have the conversations, but I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I um, also, I just don't feel sexual attraction until I feel safe yeah. and comfortable emotionally. So yeah. um, it's just not even something I desire or like go after. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's talk about um, hierarchical polyamory a little bit. So we can define that as well, um, because you know you've experienced relationships where you came into a couple's dynamic. Um, so when you've got again solo polyamory, generally speaking, correct me if I'm wrong, is um, someone who wants to to be in deeper relationships with multiple people, but is choosing to not have a nesting partner. Yeah, or merge finances, or merge finances. generally right. don't have kids. Right. Yes. So no, no nesting partner, none of that serious stuff happening, but they still want to have deep, meaningful relationships with the people that they're dating. Yeah. Um, in hierarchical, hierarchical polyamory, that's a tough one. Um, couples choose to have hierarchy of relationships um, where their relationship comes first, and then they're going to put rules on other people or treat other people, um, or treat that relationship with, with, with preference. And if you, if you can imagine bringing those two together creates a rub because you've got solo polyamorous who are trusting and wanting to dive deep and wanting to feel safe and seen and loved and connected. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you've got hierarchical polyamorous who want to feel safe and seen and loved and connected in their relationship uh, first and then bring in thirds or fourths or whatever the case might be. So everybody is ultimately trying to get the same core human needs met, but yeah. there's that rub, right? Between between the, the two styles of non-monogamy. Yeah, there can be for sure. So um, what I found is that so a lot of people getting hurt. And when a lot of people get hurt, they end up uh, kind of like hurt, you know, kind of births extreme ex extremism in some ways mm -hmm. where the perspectives start to become extreme, right? Mm -hmm. Like if a wife and a husband are opening up their relationship and they had some sort of an experience or they're, they, they have trauma from other relationships, they're like, extreme about the rules, right? They're like, no, we need to make sure our relationship is solid and, and have veto power and a whole bunch of stuff. And that's too extreme. And they're not being considerate of somebody, another human being coming into their space, into their field and vice versa. Solo polyamorists um, have been hurt by couples. So they come have experienced that often enough. So they come to a new relationship with kind of like a little bit of, of anger sometimes um, because of their bad experience, if, if they had one and they're being protective as well. So it's like, and then, and then if it happens often enough, people start to retreat into their own camps. And it's just like solo poly polyamorous. Some of them are angry at hierarchical polyamorous. And they take on kind of like, have you ever heard of the term relationship anarchy, right? Mm -hmm. They take a, no, all relationships are equal. You know, people shouldn't make their partner more important than even other friends and so on and so forth. Like sometimes there's a crossover there. So they take that strong position and then hierarchical polyamorous also um, kind of retreat to their camp. No, we have to protect our relationship. Don't you understand? This is our marriage, our kids, our house, everything's on the line. I have to take a break from you, right? Like these things happen because everybody's going to their extremes, if that makes sense. I feel like I tend not to be a super extreme person. Yeah. Um, the things that I will look out for, you know, you mentioned rules. I don't even really entertain. If a couple says like, here are rules, I'm like, this probably isn't going to be a fit. Um, oh, that said... You, you, I, I want to give an analogy, but I'll, I'll share I'll share some things that come to mind when I think about considering um, a potential new connection. Okay. So I need so let's say there's um, 
I date men. So let's say there's a man in a primary relationship. And let's say we start connecting and hitting it off. Mm -hmm. And um, there's some triggering. Let's say his partner gets triggered or let's say his partner gets triggered. Okay. I would want him to be able to show care and consideration towards her and be with her and show up for her and help her work through her feelings while also being able to do the same for me. So I'm not interested in equality in terms of the amount of time we spend together, like all of that stuff. I'm just looking for like equal treatment as a human being mm -hmm. in the same way if I had a friendship or a work relationship and there was a conflict that I would show up and see it through. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's important. And I've actually dated um, men where a conflict has come up, his partner's gotten triggered, and the response has been, hey, can you hold on for an undetermined amount of time while we work through this? And to me, that's like, it's the equivalent of dating someone who's emotionally unavailable, which is not of interest to me. Yeah. Does that make sense? So I don't feel like that's extreme. To me, that's like a super kind of intuitive. It's not, in that case, that's not extreme. I yeah. think where the rub happens is more on the, more nuanced situations where it's just like, Hey, you know, we have a date on Thursday night. My wife broke her toe. I have to go to the hospital, but wait, we had a date. Can her brother take her? I'm just making this up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? These, these nuanced situations where it's just like, it's, it's a marginal decision. And then you can't win if you're the guy in the middle or the girl in the middle. To me, that seems pretty rigid. Um, I mean, if I had a friend and I had a dinner date with a friend and her husband broke his toe and she couldn't show up, like to me, that's like, of course, like, of course you're going to go to the hospital because you're, I don't know. Those aren't the things that, um, that I find challenging about solo poly. Yeah. For me, it's, it's two things. It's when the man isn't able to concurrently show care and consideration for my feelings as well as his primary partners, or if he takes on his primary partner's boundaries as his own. Uh-huh. That makes sense. I appreciate all of that. Um, we've got some people commenting. So if you have any questions or thoughts, please drop them in here. In the meantime, I'm going to refer to my earlier post and share some things. Um, can, I, can I just share an analogy that I think is helpful? For sure. I heard this on the, sh the podcast Polyamory Weekly. Have you ever heard of it? For sure, yeah. Yeah. So um, it was Cunning Minx, who's one of the, she's the main host, really. Yeah. And she was sharing an analogy about um, a couple that learns they're expecting. And at first, they might feel kind of that sense of fear, like, are we ready for this? And then they they have the baby, and the baby comes in and it's requiring time that they normally haven't dedicated to it and it has mm -hmm. needs and it's mm -hmm. disrupting their plans and it's taking away their freedom. Yeah. And you would never see new parents like put rules on a baby. You're not allowed to cry. You're not allowed to wake me up in the middle of the night, right? right. Like the, whenever you have new parents, they know that it's gonna be death to their previous relationship. Right. And this new thing is coming in and it's going to be a relationship 2.0. Right? right. And so I feel like oftentimes, um, especially couples that are new to polyamory or couples that are extremely hierarchical, will try to create this situation where they're preventing the death of the previous relationship by creating a bunch of rules that to me feel very dehumanizing. And I don't even enter into dynamics like that mm -hmm. um, because they are afraid of the death of the relationship. But if you're exploring polyamory by nature, it's going to be death to that relationship mm -hmm. because as Jessica Fern talks about, you're removing the container of safety that monogamy creates. Mm -hmm. Very good. So let me share some more perspectives. That was a, an amazing analogy. And, and uh, to add to that analogy, you can't put the, pa the baby back. Once the baby is born, the baby is born. There's no putting it back, putting it away and forgetting about it. And, and the decision to, to be polyamorous and to open up is that kind of a responsibility. 
So yeah, and um, I I do think so often um, there is when when a couple was previously monogamous and then decides to open up, there's kind of like maybe even unconsciously this protectiveness that they bring to their dynamic. And even if you just like, let's say you are a couple that has opened up, like just put yourself in the shoes of another person. Like, how would you feel if rules were imposed on you, especially if they were rules by a person who wasn't in the romantic dynamic? It just, I use the word dehumanizing and I have felt that in some of the poly relationships I've explored and entertained, um, which is why I no longer, Yeah. why I no longer even um, you know what you want. Now. Yeah. It's very useful. Thank you. All right. So one person commented um, from the solo poly perspective, I wasn't a priority ever, even though their relationship dynamics directly impacted me on two occasions. And then they eventually split up and I got dropped. My emotional well-being was not given due space to be processed. It has put me off solo poly now. Lessons learned, time off to integrate and recalibrate. Yeah, I can definitely, um, certainly can relate to that. Um, it's no fun. One of the things that I've done is I always try to mine the gold in relationship endings. And I've created a list of questions that I love to cover in an organic way in the early stages of dating someone who's in a primary partnership. And I'm happy to share those. Shai, I know I passed along some of those to you, but for me, they're extremely helpful in terms of gauging the type of, um, the type of poly that they practice and if it's gonna be a fit for the type of poly I practice. Very good, yes. You know, it's so interesting that you bring that up and we might even wanna do another live one day about that and really share these questions because I really am a big believer in conscious coupling, conscious relating, meaning when you get together with someone, if you don't know what you don't know, you're going to have trouble. You need to figure out the things you don't know, and you need some sort of guide to help you ask the right questions. Um, it's funny, but we spend more time interviewing colleges, inter interviewing potential employers, and relationships are a big part of our life. And we often don't interview because it seems cold and callous to interview a potential partner, but we certainly should in a, in a, in a nice way, be asking the right questions. And we often don't, we, you know, fools rush in and then, and then they pay a price. Right. Yeah. And I would even take that a step further or like a step back even and articulate what is your poly? Why, you know, why are you doing this? Um, mm -hmm. I feel like just as there are so many different ways to practice poly, yeah. there are so many different whys for poly. So for example, someone's why might be more related to like novelty, exploration, new experiences, whereas someone else's, like mine, might be more related to like deepening my relationship with myself mm. through personal growth, through communication, through working through what comes up in relationship with another person. And so if someone's seeking like sexual novelty and someone else is see seeking like emotional connection and like <laughs> deepening relationships, then that can already give you a sense like, okay, it might be a different type of connection. That makes sense. Great minds think alike. I actually um, have recently created this uh, conscious uh, relationship matrix. And just to explain it very briefly, for those who haven't heard it yet, it's the idea that we often come into relationships with an old like language of like, we're either friends or we're lovers. And there's a lot of in between area between friends and lovers that I've found in, in all of my experiences in open relationships. So what I created was kind of like a, um, I think I came up with four questions like what are your what needs are you trying to get met what needs do you lead with right mm -hmm. um what are your se sexual safety where are you on sexual safety are you more liberal more conservative what is your work life and your parental responsibilities look like um and I think that there was a fourth question I can't think of it right now I think it has to do with your attachment styles as well which which we'll cover you have a question on erotic blueprints 
What's it? Can we add one? You said no. Do you, do you include erotic blueprints or like love languages or anything? Not in this particular exercise. Okay. So there's four very basic questions to get things started, right? Like, and then based on the answer to those questions, uh, I, I came up with two spectrums. One spectrum is your emotional availability spectrum. Yeah. Meaning your responsibility or the ability to respond to this person in your life. Yeah. And it goes from one to four. So level one might be a connection um, or an acquaintance, actually. That's somebody that you're honestly both like attracted and you love enjoying time with each other. But based on answers to certain questions, you're only saying that you're available for every once in a while. It's just where you're at. And every once in a while, hey, don't call me if you've got some big things happening in your life because I'm not available for that. I hope you have others for that. Let's be honest about that from the start. A connection might be once or twice a month, a connection ship once or twice a week, and a relationship would, so a connection ship is between a connection and a relationship. A relationship is once or twice a day. It's like a relationship where that's the person that you can depend on if, some, if you have to go to the hospital or something happens, you need to move, whatever, right? So relationship, um, connection, ship, connection, and uh, acquaintance. Now that's one spectrum. And this is where it gets kind of interesting. There's also the physical spectrum, like the sexual relationship itself. And you might be um, in, available for a platonic relationship, but it's a very sapiosexual, interesting relationship, but you're not interested in being sexual with that person. You might cuddle, you might hug, um, but you're looking for more platonic. And then level two might be, all right, like I'm willing to open up a little bit, but I can only be sensual with my hands. Maybe we can kiss, but that's where I, I need to stop. Third level might be oral sex. Fourth level might be intercourse, just as an example. So then what happens is, is it's interesting. I didn't realize it's going to be a long explanation, but it's all about setting intentions, right? Because if you don't set intentions, then people suffer because their expectations are set wrong. I found that I can be a level four physically with someone, but a level two in terms of expectations for time or vice versa. I can be like a level four where I want to touch base with them every single, like twice a day because I love that but I'm only available for one or two in terms of emotional, uh, physical intimacy. I mean, sexual intimacy. Mm -hmm. So by having a little bit of a more sophisticated language, and I'm not sure how this plays out in an actual conversation. If people actually pull out the matrix and figure out where they, what they're available for. But I think we need more sophisticated language for relationships that covers these things like, Hey, this is what I'm available for. This is what I'm into right now. We can check in in a month, but right now this is where I'm at. I'm a combo of a two and a three with you or a three and a two or whatever the case might be. So I think that's important. Um, we don't have enough flexibility in our language right now where it's just like one or the other friends or lovers. Totally. I was kind of chuckling because then you throw in the wild card of attachment. And if someone doesn't know their attachment style, right and they deactivate after there's physical intimacy or vulnerability, that adds a whole nother layer, but well, that, we don't that's do exactly it. right. So if a person's like knows that they're preoccupied or anxious and they sign up for sex with someone and they never had this com sophisticated conversation of like, what is the expectation beyond this container? And then the person ghosts on them or doesn't reply to text messages or feels overwhelmed by their outreach it blows their system up. And that is very important. That's one of the questions. What attachment style? What is your history and relationships? You know, are you preoccupied or avoidant or disorganized or whatever? And I think that it, it, um, it can help a lot of people if they were able to have these conversations. It's not as romantic when you're having these conversations, but guess what? It allows you to have clarity so you can enjoy that relationship where people are available, where, where the, their yeses overlap. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I, I love Jaya's erotic blueprints. And I think like for me, I'm not a big kinkster. Mm -hmm. I, there's one kink that I'm super into, but not like typical, like BDSM is like super yeah. not my thing. 
Um, and I'm like much more of like a sensual Tantra type person. Mm. And um, I just, I, I find them super helpful because they're, especially if you have someone who's been really, really inundated by porn, their sexual desires, even if they're a four on your scale, might be a very, very different experience than someone who's a four who might lean with a different flavor. Interesting. So yeah, I think that erotic blueprints, there's five, right? And the the five love languages too. Yeah. It's five, right? Mm -hmm. So we might want to, I might want to add that to my um, conscious relating matrix yeah. um, as additional questions. Thank you for that. I just didn't want to make it too complicated for people, but I love complicated attachment styles, blue erotic blueprints and love languages and your core human needs uh, that you lead with yeah. and your, like your time availability. These are all important questions yeah. um, to ask someone that you're meeting for the first time. Yeah. Um, another comment that came in, um, v I'll read a couple real quick, see if you, any of them, if you have any feedback on any of them, right. but, uh, another person ex experienced veto power. That's super quick. A sup that's a super quick way for me to nope right out. Another person said, honestly, I just add, one of the things that's tricky is like mm -hmm. you can ask, a, let's say you ask a couple that has a primary partnership, like do you practice veto power? Yeah. They might say no. And they might say that um, from their perspective, like truthfully, and then something comes up nervous system stuff, attachment stuff, um, triggers the whole nine. And they, you know, one of the things like that I just described experiencing, which is like, my primary partner is really triggered. I need to work through this with her. Can you hang tight? Um, which is essentially like veto power, right? So even if you're trying to get clarity up front, you know, People don't always know how they're going to respond in a tough situation. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that, 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 it, that it's, um, it's ultimately this, we're all relating with each other. We all want to thrive. We all want to see other people thrive. What does that look like? It looks like understanding these questions. It looks like, um, being clear. But I think there also might, we also might want to have some consideration for the unexpected, so to speak. So um, I've experienced many relationships. First of all, I generally have never been in a relationship with a primary partner that had veto power over me or, or my choices. So I've, I've kind of like made that my rule, I guess. So I've never really been caught in too many too many challenging situations. Um, however, I've been in relationships where I recognize my partner's anxious attachment style, preoccupied, challenged by my other relationships. Mm -hmm. And I still wanted to be polyamory. Mm -hmm. uh, poly I wanted to be polyamorous mm -hmm. and she wanted to be with me and also be polyamorous as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then how do we move through the world with the preoccupied anxious features that come with it? And are there, I don't want to call them rules, but intentions, seat belts, speed limits, certain things that we can communicate to somebody new from the start mm -hmm. in an honest way, that this is what we need, that there's a lot of good here, but this is, this is what is needed to protect one person's, mm, integration uh, with their particular nervous system. And if it's clear and honest, is there, is that a good approach? Because ultimately you don't want to have anybody's feelings hurt. And then the person gets to choose, like you get to choose, like you have no rules for me, period. I don't, I don't do rules at all. But what if you're really, this is the nuance. What if you're really into someone like really, really, really into someone and they're like, look, um, we can't have sex for the first month. And that's just something that, that I, I need, I need for her to have time to integrate. Is that a non-starter for you as an example, or, or could it be something that you'd consider? 
you're asking me or were you sharing that? I'm as asking you, maybe I'm asking the, the community. Like oh. uh, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to find a place where people, where, where, where attachment theory kind of informs yeah. both sides. Yeah. If, uh, if somebody, if a third comes in and they're trauma informed, the attachment theory informed, they understand that there's another partner. The other partner is not mean about it. They're just suffering yeah. from that nervous system and their, and their traumas. Is there a world where where three people can come together and collaborate on certain, I, we call them seat belts and speed limits? Yeah. To an, to NRE and to new connections. Yeah. Um. So a couple things come to mind that I'll share. Okay. I would be curious. Let's say I experienced a trigger mm -hmm. related to the relationship. Is it only that seat belts are put on me, or is would my metamor also be open? Let's say I'm experiencing a trigger. Would she be open to a seatbelt moment? That would be something that would make me a little bit more open to it. Well, uh, okay, yeah. I mean, so this the, what we're what we're doing here is kind of like a, a pseudo negotiation, right? Uh, but but it's possible to have a negotiation, is what I'm saying, as long as the clarity and the communication is there. So yes, yeah. I mean, there's there like people can speak to their needs um, and, and through conscious communication, which we teach and, and everybody should, should learn how to practice conscious communication. There are places where solo polyamorous don't need to run for the hills and um, relationship uh, hi hierarchalists <laughs> um, don't want to, don't need to lock down their relationship every time they feel like, stuff's getting out of control. They don't need right. to like pull veto power and shut everything down. Mm -hmm. Is there a world where people can communicate uh, in conscious ways and, and work th through things? I'll give you some, let's use some examples to, to put some meat on the bones. Um, so one example was like saying no sex for the fir first month. Okay. Um, or, hey, let's, if we all, if we're all going out to dinner, Let's be platonic with each other um, to ease ease things into it. Like, let's not eye gaze and flirt. Let's all just be friends and go out and have have dinner and you know go bowling and just hang out with each other and get to know each other. That's not a rule, but it's like a seatbelt or a speed mm -hmm. limit. It's like it's mm -hmm. like a brake check to make sure that this person that I'm meeting is not like going to like you know kill me and steal my husband and all this stuff mm -hmm. that goes through an irrational mind yeah. when it's triggered. And that assumes a little bit more kitchen table poly also. In that case, yeah. Yeah. So if you're into someone, I guess you have to be into someone, you're open to certain intentions, but you're not open, you might not be open to hard, fast rules like um, you can only see the person once a month. That's it. Period. Hard stop. Once a month is the most you can see my husband. That's well, what it is. I would ask, like, what is the why behind that rule? Is right, it right. that you're afraid of intimacy? Because a, a larger concern for me is like, I don't want to enter into a dynamic where there's a cap on the amount of intimacy we can develop. So that would be more of a problem than yeah. for once. That makes a month. sense. I'm just I'm just throwing ideas out there. Um, so let me, let me see a couple of other comments while we're, while we're flowing with this. Somebody said coercive veto, preferential treatment, denial of privacy, autonomy or agency in our secondary relationship. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I've experienced because I, I love texting. I love communication in case you haven't noticed that. And, um, in, in one of the connections I had, um, regular texting, sexting was a, a part of our early connection. And I didn't realize it. And I wasn't, I didn't give consent, but it was as if his phone was hers. You know, she yeah. saw everything. Wow. And that felt like a massive violation. It sounds like it. Um, and then I learned that she got triggered by some of our texting and that caused you know, uh, a, a no, I can only imagine how often that happens. Yeah. And so, so now it's like, it's like you learn, you know, you stumble and fall and you learn. And so now I know to ask these questions up front about related to privacy. Yeah. Um, like for example, 
Uh, what's my privacy question? Oh, like how much of our physical and emotional relationship would be your preference to share with your primary partner or other partners? And then given your relationship agreements, would you be able to expect respect my boundary if I don't wish for you to share intimate details about our relationship and sex life with your primary partner? So that would for sure be something I would cover before getting involved right. with someone. That makes sense. So um, let's see. I want to see if there's any other, other comments from, from here. Somebody said, I'd love to speak as part of a couple. Yeah. With a single poly. Mm -hmm. She had as much of a voice as we did. We found a perfect one for us who said, we have to be strong as a couple to be her couple. And I wanted to be, I wanted to be an equal in our relationships once we got past the beginning parts of it. And, and I do understand how many singles are treated. Um, I guess, I guess how singles are treated when part of a triad. So I guess for them, they found someone that, you know, asserted their position and, and, and all of that. Um, and one last comment, um, where is it? I think it can most accurately be summed up in being treated like a secondary human being. Yeah. My time, my feelings, my experiences, my perspective, my entire life was secondary to everything about theirs. I bent over backwards to honor and support. Some couples may try to do better, and to them, I want to say good job, but my experience on multiple occasions has been different. Birthdays, holidays, vacations, Friday nights, lazy mornings, or Sunday dinner, death of a pet, loss of a job, all, all of quarantine. All of these moments that make up a life are solo. It, it, all, it has always been how, how can I accommodate couples' privilege and flexibility, my needs, wants, boundaries without any flexibility in their relationship with regards to mine. Yeah. Um, just to that person who wrote that, um, just like sending you love, that sounds really hard. It does. Um, like I told Shy, I have a list of a lot of questions that I love to cover before getting involved. And I think that even just the act of having the conversation and the couple knowing that like these things really matter enough to you to have a conversation about them before getting involved yeah. might, um, yeah, might kind of protect you from those experiences. And you're certainly going to have less experiences, but they won't be as painful. So if possible if you're, with you. if you're able to share it uh, inside the comments, maybe when we're done. Yeah. Um, that would be wonderful for people to have a sense of what those questions are. I think people would be super intrigued by that. Do you have access to them now to share them at all? Yeah. Is it easy for you to just drop them into the live that we're in? Just put them right in the now. comments. Let's see. Oh, I had I had the private chat on, not the comments. So now I can see the comments. Hey, everyone. Hey, guys. Okay. It's going to be a really long comment, but um, let's see if it will do the whole thing. And if not, I can post it later. Oh, I don't know if I'm able to comment. There's a private chat. If you go to Leveled Up Love, it's live and you can drop it. A, 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 okay, a, I'll put them in once we're done. Okay, sounds good. So, so ultimately, um, this conversation is about mm, balance. It's about balance. I, yeah. I just saw a comment from Joseph. This was from about a half an hour ago. Um, he yeah. said, for me, the hierarchy is because we're nesting, meaning living together. It's important to maintain the nest. Um, I'm curious what he means by maintain the nest. Do you have a sense, Shai? Yeah, I mean, I think I think what he's saying is that, and, and some couples are just, that's where they're at. You know, like their nest, their home, their kids, their life, their finances, anything that feels like it could create a danger yeah. to that. Um, you know, they, 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 they will prioritize their relationship before something else. It's kind of like, um, and look, we have a lot of like hurt people, hurt people, right? So it's also possible for somebody to take on a new partner and new partners always put on 
you know, their representative self that they want you to see. And then weeks or months into a relationship, they, they, they shift. People just shift. Like they, they don't always show their true colors on both sides, whether they're married. Oh, our marriage is perfect. And she's not anxious and she loves me being open. And then that changes right. or, Oh no, I totally get it. I want to protect your relationship. Uh, with your wife, you got that matters to me. I love her. She's great. And then something happens that that where hurt people hurt people, and they're like, "No, screw that. That was my Friday night. You're coming out with me, or we're done." Right. And then it's like, so it's like just remembering that like us human beings are are not as simple as the rules that we think we can live within, and that we change, and that people change, and you know, my partner five years ago is different than the partner I have today. Yeah. Different than the partner that I had five months into it. Because when you first meet someone, you're not as invested. You're just not as emotionally invested. So the questions are great. And I think they're important. And I also think the subsequent communication and ongoing communication is, is mission critical as well. Well, do the actions match the words is critical. Sometimes the actions won't match the words. And then we have to communicate about why. Like, I'm not one to, hmm, again, balance. So there's personal responsibility. It, mean what you say and say what you mean. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that, then I'm not interested in you. Right? Personal, that's one position. Mm -hmm. Another position is maybe leans more towards social responsibility where you're like, all right, so you're, you're not meaning what you're saying and saying what you mean. You change your mind. You're different than what, than you want to change the agreements that we originally had. And let's talk through that. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're continuously breaking intentions and creating new rules and all that, and it's creating angst, then people get to make decisions about whether or not it's a match, but somewhere between all of that, there's a place, right? Where you can communicate with love communicate consciously and kind of give people mm, some clearance for their nervous system and for their and how they adapt inside of relationships like a solo polyamorous might fall deeply in love with someone and want more time even though on the front end they know that the, 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 the wife or the husband is very busy and then on the other side a a a a, a married partner might be fine because they have another partner, but then they break up with that partner and suddenly they feel so scared. Like I'm by myself, my wife is out, my husband's out with this new person. I need more of my husband or my wife back now. Situations have changed and I'm feeling scared. Like yeah. stuff happens, right? So I, I guess all I'm saying is balance is like giving, giving our human nature some allowance in the process of trying to sort out some of these ruptures that happen between um, hierarchical polyamorous and solo polyamorous, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And I think like the original point that I shared, like when you talked about the seatbelts, is that like, let's say I get super triggered. Yeah. Like you mentioned, um, your partner, I think leans anxious preoccupied let's say I'm fearful avoidant, which I don't know if Jessica Fern covered it in depth in her book, um, but Tice Gibson has incredible content on attachment theory if you wanna do a deep dive. And she she was previously a fearful avoidant, now she's super secure. Yeah. Uh, but fearful avoidants tend to have pretty like hot or cold responses. So if they get triggered, um, they might, yeah, they might have the kind of the, that black or white approach. So let's say hypothetically, um, a secondary partner feels really triggered about something. You know, is there latitude in the primary partnership to um, to help the solo poly person process the attachment triggers they're going through? Yeah, and that's the type of kind of reciprocity that I would be interested in. For if sure. I'm exploring uh, a yeah. connection. And all these things, you know, we want to communicate them as much as we can up front and then ongoing as things come up and have the tools to have these challenging conversations and not let them implode the relationship, implode the marriage, implode the, the meaningful secondary relationship, if you want to call it that. 
Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty fascinating. I, when I personally came into this, I had almost no rules. I had a primary partner and I took on a second primary partner equal time just mm -hmm. because that's high roll. And I had no seatbelts, uh, no speed limits, right? I was, I was just one day you're my primary partner. The next day I meet somebody else and I'm spending time with them because I want to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I thought my partner was okay, but she wasn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about attachment styles. I didn't, I, I gave my new partner absolute equal care and attention, mm -hmm. right? Right out of the gate. And harm was caused by that because I wasn't trauma informed. And, and I, and, and I, and, and I learned from that, you know, at the expense of my partner, but I learned from that, that, you know, slowing down and being tantric about it, mm -hmm. um, is important. Um, and maybe once you do have, you know, like even Jessica Fern talks about the vessel, there are times where, you know, a couple, um, may need to put Polly on pause. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually recently decided to do that for the first time in 10 years is put Polly on pause and just take a month off and do that without any resentment is just to, to let my partner's nervous system recalibrate and regroup. Did you have other relationships besides Leah at the time? Um, yeah, I live with Leah and Chrissy. Um, but oh, it's like new, new polyamory, all, all, all new relationships. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. To me, that's very, it's a very different experience when you say like, we're closing, um, you know, I'm putting Polly on pause. Well, I, I and, and just to clarify, Chrissy and I are, are in a state of friendship right now. Okay. It's, it's, it's complicated, sure. but Leah has been my primary, primary, primary partner. And I've put, you know, Polly on pause for a period of time in order to honor her nervous system. Yeah. Um, yeah. To me, that is a very different experience than let's say you're experiencing a really intense connection with someone else and decide to pause like at the at an intense point in that connection that's when it can be really really tough to be solo poly and traumatic to be solo poly because solo polyamorous um you know they have abandoned wounds as well and yeah. being abandoned by someone is no different than the 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 partner in a marriage being abandoned. It's all risky. All of this is risky. I did want to just add um, one of the things that's been beautiful about solo poly is it really, really forces you to be very clear about your needs and to get good at communicating them mm -hmm. and to be good at being attuned to people moving slowly, sensing, like testing a little bit and then investing a little bit more, sensing like, is there integrity between their words and their actions? Yeah. I think all of those are great relational skills. And so if you're, what, if one of your poly wise is, I believe that the purpose of relationships is to show a mirror to ourselves and to deepen our relationships with ourself and our awareness of ourself. Um, then that's just going to be a home run. If you if you have these experiences and they help you see what you need and you're able to communicate your needs mm -hmm. and um, and advocate for yourself. Sure. And then and then and then follow some healing protocols too and get the help that you need that is there and it's not doesn't serve you if you are uh, if you've got trauma living in your system that hasn't been addressed. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all. It should all be relationship be for, for personal growth and healing um, and being in service to other people and helping shine those mirrors, like you said, mm -hmm. so they can find those opportunities for growth and healing. Um, <clears throat> so, all right, this, I can't believe it's already 54 minutes. Um, why don't you drop in the comments um, as soon as we drop off? I'm going to share, actually, and you can stick around and, and watch, I'm going to share some a couple of excerpts of personal therapy sessions that Leah and I had uh, with our coach, Derek Hart, who's going to be part of um, the, the Secure Poly experience. So I'm just going to play that video for everyone. 
Um, and in the meantime, if you want to drop uh, those questions in the comments, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are curious about that. And thank you so much for joining me for this interview. It was wonderful. Yeah, this was fun. Guys, if you want more on this topic or have questions, um, yeah, would love to do more. Would love to hear your experiences. Um, we're all in this together. So great to be in connection with all of you tonight. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. And uh, guys, hang tight. I'm going to share a couple of things with you. And Leah, I'll be in touch as well. Thank you.